Well, here we are together again. Um, <laughs> one more gathered here. Yeah, one more before lunch. Uh, and I want to make an announcement for Professor Ban. He is putting a number of books on the railing outside the library, which um, will be there. No, 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 no. no. We'll, 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 we'll tell you if there are any. They will not be up there until after this. Oh. <laughs> okay. So, but don't go running up there to try to find these books, please. Have you been to his house? His his personal library is more than the library. Yeah. <laughs> I keep teaching because uh, as long as I keep teaching, they won't take me out of the office. Find a person who can get hurt. Not say that. Early cow to move out of that office. <laughs> It's the most organized office in the school. Yeah. It's like an archaeological site. Exactly. All right. So uh, we've oh, left Silver Spring and now we're going to Baltimore to see uh, some housing typologies uh, explored. Uh, Samantha is going to take us there and he's going to take us Okay, so I'm Samantha Zuber, um, and this thesis is From Suburban to Suburban, Re-Envisioning the American Dream. Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking Joseph Williams and Carl Dupuy for helping me through this process, uh, and then all my friends and family for the emotional support over these three and a half years. <laughs> Um, so, I grew up in a small steel town in Pennsylvania, uh, in a small clear-cut developer neighborhood. All of our houses were of three options, lined up in a neat little circle. And for the better part of the last 80 years, this detached house of one's own out in the suburbs was the image of the American dream. However, with changing generational attitudes towards cities and sustainability, we're seeing more and more people leaving these suburban and exurban conditions. Um, Younger generations are showing a preference for city life. Previous generations are showing they're maintaining their preference for suburban conditions. Um, however, with this exurban exodus, we're seeing more of a demand for housing options in cities. Uh, so one of the factors great, most greatly affecting this demand is the new image of the family. So today's families or co-families are much more complex, they're much more diverse, uh, they're much more inclusive than the nuclear families of the 1950s. Additionally, uh, research is showing that a greater percentage of certain minority demographics are already living in multi-generational housing options. Um, and these minority groups are only going to be growing in the coming years. So this has led this thesis to the question of how can we support these changing family dynamics and this mass exodus from the exurbs? And how can we encourage families or tempt them into this transition? So these are a few of the existing social typology terms. Um, they're used with varying definitions, but for the purposes of this thesis, I'd like to define this typology as co-family housing. Uh, and it possesses uh, aspects from every one of these social housing uh, typologies. And this thesis focuses on developing typologies that are currently underrepresented in the housing market, more specifically three co-family typologies. Uh, and they address varying degrees of shared space, private space, and courtyard space. So to start, I'd like to talk about the development of those typologies and the design principles that emerge from this process and research. Uh, so the target population are starter families, extended families, step families, isolated social groups such as single parents and senior citizens, co-families, and roommates. So um, through user interviews and researching the history of today's suburban fabric, it was determined that a lower density housing option would be the most approachable for families just moving into cities, uh, while also staying intimate enough to be uh, to still be have a sense of familiarity. Um, and approachability. Uh, so some of the images that came up several times during the interviews were this image of a home that was intimate enough to still maintain genuine social connections uh, and also permanence of place, something that people said weren't as present for them in some of their apartment housing situations. Uh, some of the concerns that came up that will be addressed later are privacy, shared responsibilities, who's paying for this, who's cleaning, um, and security. 
So to talk about financing, there are two main options. Uh, so if you're a family and you're looking to build or buy, you can visit uh, various lending institutions to get a joint loan. Uh, you can pool resources, but the most important thing when entering into a co-family housing situation is that you go in with a very clear contract, whether or not that's a social contract or a legal contract. Who is expected to be paying for things? And if you're living with parents, you need to set thresholds, limits. Um, and then the other option is developer-driven, so with the intention of ultimately renting. There are several existing business models that are already being used for co-living apartment companies, uh, so that would be the expectation for the rental models. So this method outlines uh, the development of two to four-story infill houses. The number of stories are in direct response to adjacencies, context, and street typologies. So when, when looking at uh, massing and morphology, there were two main drivers, uh, historical precedent and then the transitional zone between public and private. So transitional zones are obviously important everywhere, but they seem to be very important in higher density areas and communal situations. Uh, because of this, a courtyard party was settled on for the basis of these houses. So when approaching program and sizing of program, based on this targeted user group, uh, various suburban typical layouts were averaged and analyzed. Uh, they range from 1,500 square feet to 2,500 square feet. From this, these basic program blocks emerged and their average sizes. And through precedent analysis of other social typologies, two of these emerged as essential non-core elements, which were uh, storage and foyer space. So the foyer being, yet again, one of those very important transitional elements. So these three uh, typologies investigate various distributions of courtyard space and how those courtyard spaces function. And yet again, because transitional spaces are so important, all of these houses will always be accessed from a street edge via a courtyard space. Uh, the tallies from before also helped inform a basic building footprint requirement and lot dimensions. So this is the shared courtyard. Uh, it relies upon a larger interior courtyard with the houses wrapping around it, similar to palazzos or Italian apartments. Uh, you can access the, your house via a gate and then an interior door off of this courtyard. The private courtyard relies upon a smaller cutout in the building that acts more as a light well or an interior garden. This typology is more similar to townhomes. Um, if your lot is long enough, you can also place a second house on the back end of the lot, introducing a second courtyard space or a backyard. And then the split courtyard relies upon one long bisecting courtyard space that functions as an interior street. Uh, these are more similar to Mews in England. Um, while this might seem similar to the shared courtyard, it differentiates itself with its function because of the pure length of the lot required and because of the linear circulation of that interior street. So moving on to program adjacencies and sequence of spaces, uh, the main considerations here were, uh, were circulation and privacy. So when considering exposure, you wanted to keep all of the public spaces towards the front end of the lot near the public street, private spaces towards the back end of the lot. And then through user interviews, unsurprisingly, the kitchen emerged as the heart of the home but also people expressed a need to be able to access this kitchen via public and private paths. And these paths might not necessarily need to intersect or overlap. Uh, because of this, the party emerged of the public and private spaces bookending the kitchen with a transitional corridor acting as a spine. So uh, discussing vertical loading of these spaces. So there are three approaches, stacked, distributed, and collected. So stacked is where every program block is equally represented on every floor. In distributed, you have every program block represented, but they might be changed, their sizes are morphed to create main rooms on each floor that are vertically distributed. And then collected is where you put all of the main program blocks on one floor, creating one main floor. So for the purposes of this thesis, only stacked and distributed were considered because they create less inequality amongst the groups and they also encourage more vertical circulation and interaction. So implementation. So when considering moving a family into a city, there's a lot of requirements, but also a family that has such a 
varying um, demographic group. It's also really important to consider education, you know, libraries, schools, community centers, um, amenities, parks, groceries, <laughs> entertainment, and the transportation. How are we getting around? How walkable is it? Um, can my kids get to school? Can I get to my activities? Uh, so for these case studies, Baltimore, Maryland was selected more specifically north of Patterson Park. So this area affords generous access to parks and schools. These are walking radiuses. Um, and then considering the, the food deserts in Baltimore, good access to groceries as well. Uh, and then so the locations, uh, locations for these case studies were selected to optimize the response to street typologies and lot availability. Uh, so areas of Baltimore are obviously suffering from high vacancy rates and under investment. Um, so these three uh, interventions could help with reinvestment and occupancy. Additionally, they greatly increase much needed density. So putting more eyes on the street and also activating previously unprogrammed and vacant lots. So today, because our time is short, I'll walk through just one of the typologies. So it's gonna be the private courtyard. So I'd like to start by talking about the overall house placements on the lot and those co-family groupings. So on this side, on Patterson Parks, we have two houses that are three stories each. Each floor houses one group of the co-family. So in total, you can have six to 12 people living in each of these houses. In this back house facing Madera Street, it's two floors, and each floor contains two groups of the Cove family occupying that house, and that house can have four to eight people. So speaking of how materiality can help reinforce some of those design principles of transition, community, and privacy, uh, these homes are really trying to create internal communities in these cities, so areas of refuge and domesticity. So the exteriors are gonna be a little bit more solid, a little more opaque, and the interiors are gonna be more permeable and transparent. Speaking more specifically to the private courtyard, this outer wall is more layered, reinforcing the idea of transition. Uh, one of those layering elements is this wood slot screen, which helps with visual privacy along that street edge. Uh, you can see this first courtyard space is being, uh, the occupant is being veiled from the public eye, allowing themselves to collect, collect their belongings before exiting or entering the house. So uh, the structure further reinforces the image of home with the classic uh, gabled roof, simple uh, windows. The construction is uh, stick built with brick veneers and a ornamental larch wood screen. So looking at the first floor, we're, for, we're greeted with a semi-enclosed stoop, which is one of the first transitional courtyards. This moves into the transitional spine, which also houses the main stair. So this transitional spine does not share any space with the public rooms because it also functions as the vertical core shared by all three floors. It connects the public and private spaces via a bridge, which in this case is a library, and it abuts the second courtyard space, the interior garden. So the kitchen is placed between the public and private spaces as stated before. It has two access points to facilitate flow, and it is a closed layout to allow for privacy. Uh, the transitional hallway leads into the private hallway, which acts as a collection point for a shared bath and for the laundry, laundry room. And then you have your second private stair located here as well. Ultimately, this feeds into the backyard shared by all three houses. So now if we move to the other side of the lot, on Madera Street, we enter the house via this atrium space that houses the main stair. And that feeds into a transitional corridor that connects the public and private spaces, but also acts as a buffer zone from that very open entry space. And then the kitchen, placed between the living room and the bedroom, has three points of access. In this case, you have two public and one private. Um, this is also an open layout because in this house, the groupings are one bedroom, so visual privacy isn't as much of a concern, and also to allow for more light access. So uh, to facilitate guest navigation of these houses and to reinforce boundaries and etiquette amongst the housing occupants, the vertical stacking of each of these spatial types is maintained. So I'll give you a moment to look at the public transition and private spaces. Uh, 
Uh, so to give you an idea of who is living here, I'm going to run through a couple scenarios. There are numerous permutations of the, people's, the people who can be housed here. So um, in one of the Patterson Park Ave houses, you could have a multi-generational family living here. So on the first floor, you could have grandparents. You're usually going to reserve this first floor for anybody who's physically disabled. On the second floor, you can have the older sibling, their spouse, and one child. The third floor, a younger sibling, their spouse, and two children. In the second house on Patterson Park Ave, you could have completely unrelated people living together. So on the first floor, parents with a college grad child. The second floor, two couples that might be friends. And the third floor, a remarried couple, two young step-siblings and one older step-sibling. So in this situation, this is more of a shared housing experience. So on the communal scale, you're going to want somebody living here who's looking for that. Um, on the Madeira Street side, this is actually more of a co-housing situation on that communal scale. So it's ideally set up for two retired couples on the first floor and then say uh, two single parents on the upper floors with loft. So talking about how the communal spaces have been stacked, um, the Patterson Park app houses, they've been distributed. So you have all of these spaces fluctuating in size and they're vertically distributed. This encourages a high degree of interaction and vertical circulation. So you're gonna, this might be a better option for families looking to build or buy. On the other side, on the Madeira Street side, you have the stacked vertical loading. So all of them are equal, and this uh, encourages a medium degree of interaction or visitation. It might be ideal for a developer looking to rent out to curated occupants. So to give you an idea of how these communal spaces manifest, I'm going to run through some of the perspectives. So this is a library and garden on the first floor of the Patterson Park Ave house. Uh, so not only does the library uh, provide much needed storage in this situation, it also allows for introspective spaces for the occupants looking or seeking calm. This is the dining room on the second floor of the Patterson Park Ave house. This is where the co-family can come together for shared meals. Uh, additionally, the kitchen has a balcony that activates the courtyard vertically and creates a dialogue between the dining room and the kitchen. On the third floor, we have the great room. So this floor you might want to reserve for the family that has maybe the most children. Obviously, children from the other floors can come up, but this living room space can also function as a play space. And then this mezzanine floor can be uh, converted into a loft bedroom for guests or another child. And then we're in the backyard, shared by all three houses. So this can be more programmed. You can have your community garden here, you can have a dining area, or you could leave this more unprogrammed, like more typical suburban backyards for flex use. So while we're not going to have the chance to really dive into the other two typologies, I wanted to also show some of the common spaces that happen there. So this is the interior street of the split courtyard, which you can find here. <laughs> so this interior street is activated not only by having the house fronts facing inwards towards the street, but also these bridge elements that have the sunrooms and the terraces. The living room on the first floor, which is here, um, is a less customized layout, a little bit more typical of size because in this housing typology, the arrangement is stacked. And then this is the foyer space in the shared courtyard, which is here. So yet again, we have a built-in that's providing um, storage and also a collection point for people coming in and out of the house. But also, very importantly, it's providing a buffer zone from this open living room and then this circulation corridor. And then we have the, sh the courtyard, the shared courtyard, which is here. And so this is really important because it's allowing the occupant to step out of the busy flow of public traffic and acclimate themselves back down to a smaller scale of domesticity of their shared home. So it's functioning kind of like a front yard. So these typologies, when used appropriately, can not only help address changing generational trends, but they can um, they can encourage the integration and an engagement of previous generations and different demographic groups. So ultimately, this is going to lead to more heterogeneity within your uh, housing market. It's going to have more density within your neighborhoods and then more diversity within your communities. So I'd like to open it up for any questions or comments. Um, 
So I think the idea of co-housing is going to appeal to, especially as we change our choices for senior living with that demographic growing rapidly in the millennial, kind of the two anchor um, generations that are competing and see that happening. Plus most of us are living a little bit longer and we're, um, we're in those spaces um, where you know, our, our children have gone off to college or they're transitioning back and we're sort of, or we, we still have younger children and we have older parents. So I think there are a lot of good um, reason. I think there would be a lot of demand for this type of housing in an urban situation. Um, I, I know this site really well because we do the Adopt the Schools program at the Patterson Park Charter School, which is just um, on the same block, essentially, of what you were looking at, um, and the park space is a great amenity, so I think the site is well chosen. Um, I will say, I feel, you know, maybe it's my sensitivity to um, urban typologies, and I feel like the architecture, um, how it addresses the street is a little, um, it, it's rebelling against, it's actually bringing suburbia a little bit into the urban form, and I think I would have, um, preferred to see something that um, maybe respects that urban fabric, which is, you know, I mean, as you know, the urban row house in Baltimore is iconic. It has the street. I feel like this would um, stand out in a way that maybe feels like suburban uh, typologies came into the city versus looking at how a co-housing could cohabitate with the already existing urban form. Um, you know, a decorative wood screen um, that projects a, a gable front that's um, a little against the fabric, you know, that's there. I'm not sure um, would have been the direction I would have liked to have seen. I think you could play with the materiality that's there, you know, brick and the stoop typology that's currently there. Um, I've been more playful with that, but not to introduce a suburban um, form within that, and maybe the courtyards could have been a way to have some, you know, be a little bit more liberal about that. Um, so, I, you know, I would challenge that, but I think a lot of the spaces um, are good. I, I the, well, the, the only other comment I have about the layouts, and maybe I, you know, need to look at them a bit more, but um, the kitchens seem a little more isolating um, than your the discussions that you had about them. I think we're on target, but I, when I see them in plan, they feel like the galley style kitchen. Um, they're some are isolated, some aren't, but some are um, you know behind a separate wall. And I feel like I would start to erode that um, so that you have a lot more conditions where people hang out in the kitchen and they're seeing the living space and that communal gathering space. And there's actually room to, to gather. And I see, you know, maybe it's not one person cooking in the kitchen, but it might be three or more. And I just don't see that being very functional in those particular kitchen layouts or constricted by even where it is open with having seats on the end of an island um, would prevent circulation around that island. So, I mean, just nuanced points of, of that, I think. But if we're looking at, I mean, this is a housing typology, so looking at that critical space, which was your, you know, your kind of key point linchpin of the gathering space, I would like to have seen a little bit more, you know, thought about the circ circulation and gathering patterns that would happen in those kitchen spaces. Yeah, I think that's all. Um, that's all very well put, and. Um, First of all, let me commend you because I think this is really fascinating and the, the, the first part, the analysis was just great. Taught me a lot of things that I didn't know at least. Um, so I think with, with you, we're going to get into the more, as we just, as she just did, with the details than the, the basic scheme, which I think is great. So, you, you know, it's the right scheme and you have multiple right schemes. So. So then we get to get to sort of the next level of talking about it. And, and these are things that you might develop more over time. But I, I certainly agree with the comment about the um, front elevations of the buildings. I think, you know, in Baltimore or any row house community, I mean, this line is very, very important. And 
you know, if you wanted, so you're, you're creating an interesting problem for yourself, which is you want to come in on the ground, I understand that, you don't really want to go up, but you have sort of that much to get it in and it's not enough. Um, so it's a problem, right? Mm -hmm. but, I, but I think that the solution to that would have probably been to cut these buildings off here, have the taller part, but push it back. Okay. Um, you know, and, and push it back to be a few feet. It doesn't have to be a lot. Mm -hmm. And that could be, you know, a balcony off the mezzanine or, or whatever you want it to be. Um, and also I think that the, the comment about the kitchens I think is important to just really emphasize because the one that you showed, which I don't know where it is now, that it had the kitchen on the bridge with the balcony, that I totally bought. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's actually kind of awesome. To, um, but it, but it's really that is a complete opposite of the kitchens in the other plants. Yeah. Because that kitchen is really a gathering space or a transit. You know, you go through it, mm -hmm. which I think is actually very appropriate. Um, but when it's sort of pushed off in a corner, I, I just I think that we would you know for us and we do a lot of single family work. That would be the first thing we tear out, mm -hmm. is all those partitions you have between them and the rest of the space. So, just a little advice. Well put, both of you. Um, I do a lot of housing as well, and we're doing co-housing now, and so it is certainly something to think about. There's lots of companies that are coming into, into this area, common, one of them, and, and, and uh, Medici Living and all these other folks. Um, and, you know, we're constantly looking at buildings in, uh, in terms of bedroom counts, right, for in urban areas. Um, I, I commend you for your uh, analysis and uh, typology development, which I think is very, uh, very interesting. Uh, I feel like your plans are somewhat uh, conventional. And I feel like they're, you've, um, when I squint my eyes on this, because it's right in front of me, there's so much circulation. Mm -hmm. And I think this is probably about moving through spaces to get to places rather than in hallways. But you've, you know, you've sort of established this, you know, these, these halls that are not that nice to be in, maybe. But if you could sort of uh, try to uh, integrate it into the spaces, maybe more like there, you know, big spaces, definitely open kitchens and that sort of thing. And then go to the idea of how these are built. And these are modular probably, you know, and you need to say, this is our module. This is how we're building these. And you have, you know, the Wellington and the, you know, there's, there's different widths of modules, right, as EYA does, um, to think about how this is made. And, um, you know, and I think from an architectural standpoint, there, there is something different, maybe, and you've started to explore that, and, uh, you know, I always want my building to be taller than the next, that's right, so I don't want to be lower, so, so I, want, I want to be a little higher, that's all. <laughs> Just a comment about that corn slide. I think your argument would be stronger if you showed the whole elevation of the street because you probably would find buildings that did that. Right. right. I mean, in the absence of that information, that's what we have to go on. I, I don't have a problem with breaking that line. It probably happens all the time there, but you probably want to make the argument that it's part of a large, broader context. I think that's one of the elevations. I think there's. They had some Victorians that have a little gable, yeah. but they're treated very specifically. Yeah. One thing I wanted to commend you on uh, was the uh, adoption of the courtyard as this, this link between uh, these uh, spaces. Um, I, I'll be frank, I'm, I'm not too familiar with Baltimore, um, but the idea I have of Baltimore is that it's a place that uh, is in dire need of renewal. And it's a place that <coughs> is um, a bit unsafe, perhaps. And I think um, introducing this oasis of peace and safety in the building uh, is very attractive, um, both uh, from, a, uh, uh, from a connection point of view between different generations, as well as for a commercial uh, 
point of view because people would want to be displaced. This is not that uncommon uh, in other countries uh, where you actually have courtyard buildings because of that reason. You see it all the way from Paris to El Salvador. You know, um, uh, the idea of, of, of sharing um, uh, space with, with different generations is a commendable one and your analysis proves to me, I, I never actually thought about it that much, but I learned something today where uh, made me think how um, are we are going to age uh, and how uh, are, we, are, we, are we going to be living with our kids? Is this something that, that's going to be, I mean, student loans are huge and kids are coming back home. I have neighbors that have uh, college graduates coming back home and living and so you do have this kind of situation happening. I totally agree with the comments on the elevations, but at the same time, part of me is loving it. Uh, and, and, uh, there's something about those elevations that are so intriguing um, and provocative um, that, um, like uh, Bill just said, you know, I, I, I want my building to be a little taller than the other one on the side. So, so, so Matt's comment of showing a full street elevation probably would vindicate you a little bit, saying that this is probably not uh, uh, like a bad solution for what you're doing. So, uh, love it. I will agree with my colleagues here. I, this is a really provocative and interesting presentation. Um, I think it addresses one of the most fundamental problems of our time, which is adding dense residential density specifically to existing cities. Uh, this is a very creative way of going about that in, a, in an established context such as Baltimore. Um, and uh, I really appreciate, I, I think this thesis is about kind of Another aspect of it is, what is the fundamental idea of a unit, a residential unit? You're really breaking that apart and kind of opening up the possibilities as opposed to kind of traditional um, ideas about a residential unit or a house or, you know. And so I appreciate that discussion about new family structures and et cetera. It, it made me realize I've lived in a co-housing situation my entire life in various um, permutations. And um, I think about my house right now where I, it's a suburban, townhouse in, in a residential, in a townhouse community. Um, but my, my neighbors, it's a multi-generational Bolivian family and they have, um, it was four generation, generations in one house and you know, they have a backyard, I have a backyard. When, when they have a party, I kind of join their party and vice versa. Uh, and it got me thinking, you know, th this really is an important concept and, and kind of the design is very, very important. I will say just um, one aspect that, um, has been picked up today is I, I think the more tight sites get and the more tight units get, um, the less walls you can really afford. Yeah. And so if I squint my eyes, I think you have too many walls in your units. It really needs to open up and be space efficient. Corridors, you can't really afford corridors in your units. But, but you know what, there's, to me, I agree, but how do you separate people? Yes. I sure you know, that. That's the problem. <laughs> yes. I'm sure you probably want to do it enough the entire thing. Mm -hmm. But then you do on privacy. Absolutely. So how do you achieve all of it. Absolutely. Um, so that, that there's a tension that, you know, privacy versus public and, you know, I, I think... always could be places where you might, they'd be big enough to have a desk or they're not just hallways. Yeah. But so some of them... She has some of them. So like, yeah. in yeah, this in situation library. it was a library, but right. this was a play space that was most, you know, cats can play on it. That's the question I have. <laughs> the question I have is, is it a good idea to have those bedrooms looking out onto that communal courtyard? There is there is there? Did you ever look at a scheme where the kitchens opened up onto those? And, um, I did. Seems like there's a bit of a kind of public-private problem there. I think I, I was I was thinking the lesser of two evils. So this is my own chosen exposure versus putting any of the private rooms on the front end of the lot. Yeah. Um, also, just for sound, I feel like you when you move into these co-family situations, you have social contracts amongst you. How are we treating the backyards? When are we using them? How much noise are we making? But obviously There's that's no a question. good as well. I mean, if, if, it is a, if it's truly a place for everybody, I think the adjacency of the bedrooms there might be a little bit of a problem. Now you could probably deal with that with the landscaping and providing right. smaller private areas near the bedrooms and shielding them off a little bit. I don't see that quite there, but you probably want to think about that. Okay. So here's, here's another thing to think about, and, and here's where I'm, I'm looking at this earth, the, the 
plan of the city of Baltimore or this part of Baltimore behind you. And I'm, I'm thinking I want to unleash my inner Robert Moses here. And uh, I'm not running highways through it, don't worry. Um, but if you have to it, here's here's the curse of Baltimore. <laughs> The curse of Baltimore is that they have way too many 12-foot wide houses. Yes. <laughs> I mean, nobody wants to live in a 12-foot wide house. And, you know, they, they were very appropriate at the time they were built for steel workers, auto workers, that, you know, people who worked in the harbor. Yeah. That all made sense then. So, really what you're talking about here, I don't know if these lots are empty now, are they? Or, or did you take some out? So, this was an empty lot. This is an abandoned restaurant, and then this is um, a strange ephus kind of structure. That's one story, but uh, I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think I think that's great that you pick sites that are already empty, but it, it seems to me if you were going to look at this in a, as an urban design problem, mm -hmm. you would start to think about. I might take out three of those 12 foot wide houses on this block, three, you know, you know, you could sort of look at that as a pattern going across here because I think, you know, your, your scheme is so good that some selective demolition on these blocks to be replaced by this kind of housing would improve the whole block. I have initially looked at something like that, but um, there's such an issue with the displacement and really getting the community on board with it that I, I guess I kind of gave up the good fight and um, I went with the easier selection of vacant lots, I but know, I definitely agree. Sense. It makes sense well, to really know. bring the neighborhood back, you need a combination of both. And, yeah. and, and what, what, what I learned about Baltimore recently is kind of interesting, which is the east side. <laughs> The east side around Patterson Park had smaller houses because that was the working class neighborhood because it was near the port. Mm -hmm. And so that tended to, to produce smaller buildings and they were more modest and things. And the problem on the east side is different than the west side. The west side, like like Harlem Park and things like that, the houses are too big. Mm -hmm. They're way too big. And so they, you know, the, the business of you know, 4,000 square foot row house is just uninhabitable really for a single family. So I think this is a good strategy to start to kind of infill those things and, and, and find that increment of urbanism in different ways that does that. Um, I think the, um, what, what I really admire about what you've done is the sort of, the net you've cast wide about different site conditions, these long and deep conditions versus deep but also wide and then also these corner conditions. It's almost like you can take the neighborhood and go around and say, well, this is a type and we find different places where that typology works. And I think that's probably what Baltimore needs because in order for a builder to really make money, they have to be able to build at scale. They have to be able to build like 20 of those <coughs> where they would be able to make money. And so finding one, one logical next step would be to say, well, this type fits in 15 different locations and here's where we can do it. And then somebody gets teed up to do all of that. And then you can start to see where the economies of scale could come to rescue in some of these things. So I would, the one thing I would say about your rural presentation, which I think, which I thought was really good, um, you have a future in that, um, and this is something that architects do all the time, so we have to convince people that our ideas are good, and you've done that. Um, so at the beginning, I was wondering a little bit if these were real sites, and clearly they are. Um, I would have liked a little more discussion about the sites themselves. Okay. And actually, I think it would have been great if you'd had some photographs of the sites, um, because this is a real place. Mm -hmm. So that would have been really cool. And we talked about, you know, having photographs of the entire block so that we could see this in, the, in context. That's and then, by the way, in real life, that's absolutely something you would have to do. Yeah. So. Just to follow up on that, yeah, I mean, Patterson Park is not one of the neighborhoods that is really, I mean, there is high demand for the housing here. <clears throat> I have several colleagues that have lived or have lived in it, so it's, you know, professionals that live. This is not an area of the city that is completely eroded, although there are some vacancies, of course, just because of um, the length of time some units have been vacant. I do think it would be good to take the typical condition and have a solution for that so it could be inserted and have that ability to be replicated. I think that is important in most 
I'm sure most people who work with single family developers here will know it takes a minimum of 40 units to have a marketable project. Um, it's very hard to go in and finance and do these you know, single one-offs. So having something that could be replicatable, that would be um, you know, something that could be marketed would be important. Um, but I do think this neighborhood, I mean, it's a good starting point because there's such a demand, and I think this area would appeal to those who who would want um, this type of housing. I think, you know, it, it probably is not, as designed, it's not a super affordable model yet. I mean, I think it, that's sort of the next evolution is how do you work in affordability uh, within this prototype, because I think that's also necessary. Um, just a, one more thought on the, uh, just kind of the idea of co-housing and how, uh, you know, in my personal experience and just kind of observing my neighbors and colleagues that have lived in co-housing, I think it tends to self-sort vertically. Um, when, when I moved back with my parents for a couple of years during the recession, I, I wanted to be away from my parents as much as possible, you know, just to kind of for their sake as much as mine. Um, and, and I think that's a pretty natural break when I, you know, think about my neighbors and myself. And my, you know, I think self-sorting vertically is often kind of the natural solution that people t trend to in urban contexts. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, maybe addressing Ralph's comment on kind of the problem of the cornice, maybe maybe the second floor is, grows a little bit bigger and you have a sectional idea about uh, sub-separation within the unit. Mm -hmm. And that helps you with the cornice problem and also kind of helps you with the separation problem. I think there's a lot of variation in the section that maybe you could have explored a little bit more. I feel like when my daughter's from, from college, I'm living in co-housing. <laughs> that was a lot of statistics. <laughs> well, you're her fan. <laughs> so I, I just want to say a little bit about um, the urban condition that Ralph sort of started to talk about. To say, uh, you know, there's a module that was set up in that area, and I think what happens when new architecture goes into old areas, we forget about those, the DNA of the site. That's what I call. Uh, I don't work in Baltimore, but in D.C., I know that you know, Mr. Lafont set up. Uh, you know, house modules in his planning. And it was a real estate proposition that he did, and we still deal with it that way. And I think when a building starts to violate those, those uh, datums, those uh, rhythms, that's when it's, the architecture seems to look out of place in an existing area. The 12-foot module, oddly enough, and you don't know this, but when you do a multifamily building, you work on a 12-foot module. It's a living room, it's a bedroom, okay? So that's not a foreign, you know, you could do a multi-unit building on a 12-foot module and it would be comfortable. And you could figure it out. Now, maybe it didn't have all those hallways, but you would figure it. The hallways don't have to run to the street. They're, they're inboard, so. No, that's how you deal with it. Yes, you know, I look at this plan here and, and I'm thinking about that courtyard there. And I'm wondering if, if part of the problem a little bit is the bilateral symmetry of the plan. You know, and I'm wondering if, if a different model of the units where maybe they they interlock in such a way that you can always get the living room on the courtyard side so it's a public space. Instead of them right. instead of tracking across like this, if there was a different way to configure that or, or that it was a ground floor unit that uh, it might be horizontally organized and a two-story unit that might be vertically organized so they could still get the public spaces on the courtyard space. Mm -hmm. There, That would be one way to do it. I think the sort of symmetry on either side of that and the, the publicness of the street is kind of forcing certain decisions there and make, making the courtyard into less of a communal space, I think, that you think it is. Okay. I just so, wanted so, Sorry, one, one thing. So one thing I would say about all three schemes that we've seen so far, that is probably going to apply to all the ones we see today, watch these sections. You notice how every single time we've talked about sections, because section is a tool of space. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when I look at that section, I think she drew that because she had to, <laughs> not because that was a real tool of architecture. Yeah. But, um, two points. Um, one, I don't think anybody's spoken about your drawings, Sam, and they're they're gorgeous. Um, I've been thinking about you know they have they communicate in really interesting ways. They have a certain style to them that's interesting. It feels like they could be printed on a riso machine. Um, and 
have this kind of animate quality, but not that there's something that you've invented with the way that you've drawn these um, images. And it all, they have a sense of being diagrams and also communicating space when they're perspectives or and diagrams in other ways. So I think everybody, all the students here should note that. Um, and it's something really, really want to commend you on. Um, I haven't seen drawings like this, and that's a good thing. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is this interesting conversation about fit and the idea of creating a module that could be applied in different conditions around the city. And I would say that there's also thinking about how the context is different. Mm -hmm. So in this neighborhood, we have a lot of buildings that are still there. Mm -hmm. In another neighborhood where there are less existing buildings, maybe the fit is creating a new kind of image for it. And as part of really acknowledging this effort of, an, of a rejuvenation of the city. Mm -hmm. So the question of whether they should all look like what's next to them and keep the same height. I mean, you know, that question of how we negotiate that and what that meaning is, um, is, a, is a really interesting one to grapple with. And I think it may be different yeah. in the different context. And that it also, the difference might be welcome to people who've been living with the city falling apart yeah. as, it, as it has been. So there's another piece about that to consider in that conversation. Are there any more comments from the jury? Okay, excellent. Sam, well done. Um, it was a pleasure to chair this thesis, and uh, my idea of a good thesis is one that starts from an important idea and then has very strong connective tissue all the way down through the typology, through the design, and down into details and tectonics. And you were so... Um, you were so strict with yourself about keeping to the fundamental concepts that will translate the big idea into the design. Especially, I like this hierarchy, this kind of more granular hierarchy than public and private. It's public, transition zone, semi-private, transition zone, private, and you stuck to that. Yes, that led to a lot of hallways. <laughs> but you know, you stuck to it, and I actually think the hallways are quite nice, and then they're glazed and full of light and activity and, and very nice. Um, the courtyard was a kind of a no-brainer from the beginning, that a courtyard is such a beautiful way to um, accommodate multiple family units and uh, around a core. Um, but yeah, I think this represents a kind of consummate total design process and uh, you deserve all the credit in the world for that. Well done. Thank you.